Guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren. <lacht> Come on. Waminasan. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Spooky Town Tales. We're getting international this evening. My little German yeah. intro for my German listeners, because yes, I know I have them. I have one in particular. She's a big fan. It's a shout out. Isabel Kolb. If you're listening, <laughs> hello, ich liebe du. Okay, let's get serious. Welcome back, everybody. Serious? Don't do that. Serious. So welcome, welcome, folks, to the show. It is I, Morgana, and joining me, as per the freaking norm, he's not Norm, he's Jimmy. <laughs> he's Jimmy. <laughs> Good evening. Thanks again. For sitting by and joining in, and Jimmy's going to even read a story out tonight, folks. It's a, it's a, it's a spooky town to attempt, premiere. Attempt to Dibbit. read. <laughs> <laughs> <A dibbit. laughs> He's reading Dibbit. <laughs> if he can. Debut. Debut. Yes, he's going to debut a story. Ew. Um, I've asked him to do one tonight, just to help share the load a little bit. Yeah. So I uh, appreciate it. I appreciate it. Let's Please see how it goes. More than a useful, useless Got a giggle love. in the background. <laughs> hey, I appreciate it. So, folks, we have a mishmash tonight of some spooky ghost stories. We have a weird bunyip story in there. We have a couple of stories about possessed cars. That's right. Ooh. Not one. We've got two stories this evening two. about possessed cars. Yeah. And to top off the show, we're going to be talking about skinwalkers, which we touched on dun, dun, last dun. week. Now, a lot of people probably haven't heard of skinwalkers unless you're heavily into the paranormal as I am, mm. but skinwalkers are pre- pretty scary. Yeah. They're a scary phenomena. But we're going to be telling you all about it this evening in case you listened last week and said, what the fuck is a skinwalker? They're scary. They're scary. They're scary. I've only just chipped the ice to cap yeah. off it. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to, ed- cool, I'm going to educate you tonight, Sonny. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't even sound so creepy. It has to be creepy. It don't. We're talking about the skin. <laughs> it's got to be creepy. I'm, I'm, I'm um, inhabiting spirit of jazz. <laughs> I figured that's what you yeah. what, What's he called? Shadow Man. Anyway, let's get on track. Gonna Are you c- like a glove. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming inside you, Howard. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Are you comfortable? <laughs> I Probably bet you're not. not. Are you creeped? Good. Have you got yourself a lovely beverage? Jimmy is sipping a mm. whiskey. Yes. One I've never seen before. It's yum. Yep. Are you comfortable? Have you dimmed the lights? You have? Good job. So prepare to be. Our first story this evening is actually uh, not from Australia. Oh. I'm starting with an international one this evening from the Surrency House Ghost, which is in Surrency, Georgia. So this is an old haunting that is very popular, but very well known in the area because it was so profound and everyone that stepped foot in the house experienced or saw things, not just like something out the corner of their eye. We're talking like full-blown poltergeist yep. activity. That's so stand-out ob- stuff. Objects being moved and thrown. And this is back, this is back in the 1820, 1870s, sorry. Whoa. So this is before, you know, the 70s and stuff where people would, would rig it. Yep. You know, there was tons of those sorts of videos where people tied 
you know, fishing line and worked out. Yeah, how, yeah. Or even in the 1920s, you know, the table lifting became quite a popular yeah, trick okay. in the circuit when the paranormal became quite a popular fad. Yeah. There were lots of tips and tricks to fake paranormal stuff, but this is back, way back, when there's way more important things to worry about. There's wars, there's... <laughs> disease. Disease, all kinds of crap going on. Real stuff. Superstition, religious bloody... Anyway, so the Surrency house ghost came basically to came about in the 1870s when the Surrency clan began experiencing paranormal activity in their homestead. The whole family claimed to have witnessed objects soaring across the room, hearing laughter and crying, and they would quite often see a set of red eyes staring Mm. into the house through the windows. That was a regular thing. So that was quite frightening. Um, Food was also seen to be flung off the plates and utensils twisted into unusual shapes and unusable shapes. So Whoa. it was even it had the ability to to bend cutlery. That's pretty, pretty frightening by an unseen force. Absolutely. So that was that they were, they would find them like that. But I believe there was also an event where it was witnessed it happening, Holy which smart. would be even more Way freaky. Worse. The townspeople speculated that the occurrences were cries from. Cries of help from spirits who thought the family would, would be able to save them. Oh. So that was the theory, that obviously that something had occurred on the land. On the day that the family decided enough was enough, a fire iron floated up and started hitting one of the sons in the head. Whoa. In front of the whole family. That's not cool. So that was the day they moved out. Yeah. Well good done. Enough. That's good a good call. reason. No one was ever brave enough to live in the homestead after that. Not a soul. That is crazy. That's how, like, full on this yeah. haunting was. That people, like, you know, generally you've got skeptics in a community that would go, yeah. it's a beautiful house, yeah. why the hell nonsense, wouldn't you live nonsense. there? Oh, what a, what a bunch of bollocks. But obviously enough people had seen and heard things that they were like, fuck yeah. that. No one ever lived there again. Then the house burnt down in 1925. So that is a long time. So 1870s was yeah. when the family lived it's there, the Surrency years. family. That's crazy. Yeah. Imagine the amount of people that would have dared. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Had Halloween, it would have been a hot spot. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a, that's a really good one. I've started with that one as a segue into we've got um, there's a, a house in called the Royal Arms Guest House in the Monaro Plains in Australia. Okay. So in, in the town of Nimitable, Nimitable. Mm. If anyone knows of this town, correct me, because I would call it Nimitable, Nimitable, in the Monaro Plains. Um, so this haunting is abs- insane. It's totally insane. Same kind of level of, of stuff seen and witnessed. Yeah, yeah. So that it's apparently because of the collected amount of occurrences by a yeah. large amount of um, eyewitnesses, it's one of the most haunted places in Australia, they reckon. Smokes. So the Royal Arms Guest House, I'm just going to say in the Monaro Plains because I can't say the name of the town Fair properly. Um, it's it's currently... about my maths and you can't even do talk. <laughs> <laughs> the dealer passes, yeah. Jimmy. The dealer passes. That's a fair call, dealer. I'm not going to say a word. <laughs> <laughs> so the current owner is Rhonda Garside and when she was interviewed about the occurrences the day that like the she was interviewed she'd said that just a few days prior a white human like figure had floated through the kitchen. Whoa. So that had happened just before she gave all the, like told all her information. Yeah. So over the past 15 years Rhonda and her daughter Heidi have learned to live with a veritable gaggle of ghosts that inhibit the inn. So it's not just one. Oh. There are multiple things going on so at that's this property. What you call a, a gaggle. Group. It's yeah. a goddamned gaggle. There you go. So there's regular visions of a man, a woman, and a child. 
And these have been seen by multiple people. So this isn't just, oh, we had a guest that saw something. This is pretty yeah. much guaranteed most people that will stay there will see either the man, the woman, or a child. It was built in 1850. The building has to be the most haunted place in Australia. Mm. Due to phantom bells is one of the biggest, creepiest thing that happens there, and it happens all the time. That's pretty cool. So you hear bells ringing. Um, quite often you'll see keys turning in locked doors. That's not cool. That gets seen quite <laughs> a lot. Um, this one would just... Ugh. People have seen the face of a dishevelled woman appearing in the kitchen window. Oh. Imagine oh. making your morning. Then I kind of went, well, maybe it was just the lady that owns the place. <laughs> Gets up out of the garden, man. Who is that? That can't be me. Oh, that's a dishevelled woman. That's just me making a cup of coffee in the morning. Um, it was so severe. So, like, you've got your locks turning, phantom yep. bells, people seeing people that aren't there, faces in the windows. Apparently, it has gotten to a point when they were first living there that they. Started here's a quote. Him. Here's a direct. <laughs> Pay your goddamn rent, you sons of bitches, you freeloading specter assholes. So here's a quote from the owner. We've called the police a couple of times. A few years ago, we were convinced there was an intruder in the main hall. We hid and covered ourselves in the kitchen and called the police. <laughs> Who responded from Kuma, which must be nearby. Mm -hmm. There was all sorts of commotion but no one was found. So Whoa. basically what Rhonda and her family and the police yeah. concluded was... Don't know. Must have been ghosts. Must have been. Don't know. Don't know. <laughs> don't know. Just give us a call if uh, anything, <laughs> anything else, else happens. Happened. Yep. So how we'd imagine. Imagine. That's crazy. To the point the whole family's huddled hiding in the kitchen because it's so loud, only to find out there's not a soul in the house. Well... Uh, oh, uh, good one. Battle. <laughs> but the weird, <laughs> the weirdest thing, <laughs> the weirdest thing that people regularly hear are the bells. The bells are the, the creepiest of all of it. I'm like, well, I don't know. The face yeah. in the window is pretty, and the I locks turning. Like, yeah, I don't like locks the turning. Locks turning's That's not, not creepy. fun. Um, but the, uh, the building did used to be a, co a coach stop back in the day. Yeah. So residual, perhaps. Yeah. Residual bells ringing. <clears throat> this is uh, again. It, we're, we're still going, so we're not even. We've not even finished with oh. the, the things that are witnessed here. There is a ghostly lady who is seen lurking in the shadows at the top of the stairway outside the honeymoon suite. She gets seen all the time. Really lurking, lurking, loitering out, outside the honeymoon suite. What a perv! <laughs> I mean, we all know what goes on. In the honeymoon suite, there's a whole lot of bow chicka wow wow going on. And then you just hang And she's just out hanging out. Her. What a, a ghost creep. Literally, both. Ghost and a creep. Ghost creep, creeper ghost. <laughs> Getting her rocks off, listening in on people's fun times. <laughs> what a creep. So it's. <laughs> <laughs> Rhonda's dog doesn't like this creepy well, perv. Makes so, sense. She, so it won't go into that stairwell. It avoids it like the plague. Yep. Um, years before Rhonda bought the place, apparently she'd heard that a woman fled from the a ghostly vision by jumping from the attic window. Whoa. So she saw something and then that was that scared. Her. She climbed out the attic window, jumped from the attic. Whoa. Thank God she was in a petticoat <laughs> because it acted like a parachute and broke her fall. Um, and she just walked away with a bit of... As they put yeah. it, bruised modesty. She was a bit embarrassed. <laughs> no injuries, thank, thanks to her handy petticoat. There's oh. a tip, ladies and gentlemen. If you're ever having to stay in a haunted hotel petticoat. and you're on a, an, a, a, a high level, <laughs> anything above the second floor, pop on a petticoat for it's a quick just... escape. Safe escape. That's not a bad idea. Oh. I could totally wear a pull off a petticoat. You could rock a petticoat. Too. You could murder a petticoat. <laughs> <laughs> In 2001, so even as far as still going on, right. in 2001, a group of trout fishermen hired out the hotel and said they saw ghosts outside the window all night. 
Whoa. They took off before the sun came up <laughs> and were never seen again. That's crazy. Who wants to go and stay there? Anyone? Jimmy? Should we go? You can. Should we go to the Royal Arms Guest House? I'll wait here. You'll wait here? I would like to go because the way that it's written, they're so adamant that all this stuff's happening. It is probably the most direct Australian one that you've, you've mentioned, like so yeah. many proper solid examples. Oh, I did forget to mention that there was a, a pair of newlyweds that did stay in the honeymoon suite and they walked straight out and never came back. So I'm assuming didn't pay their bill. So they'd seen the lady, Whoa. lurking lady. Lurking lady. So it makes you wonder if this many people have had those kinds of it's experiences. I wouldn't mind going there. Sounds pretty active. Activewear. Activewear. <laughs> Bit of change of gears now. We're going to pop on over to Barawong Swamp. Whoa. Another Rocky one. Another Aussie, 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 I hadn't, which is surprising because they have their very own bunyip. Really? Apparently. Oh, that's pretty cool. Sadly, though, I'm going to read you what I found out. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure it's debunked. Uh, but it was a cool story. So, the Burrowong Swamp is fabled to have be inhabited by a whole lot of weird creatures. Yeah. But the two main ones is there is a fabled dragonfly that's been around for 190 million years, it still exists and lives in the area of the Burrowong Swamp. Whoa. An old dragonfly. Like a species. Not, it's not a dragonfly not that's one. 190 million years old. <laughs> be handy if it How was the that. hell would you even know that? <laughs> it's a type of dragonfly. That would, that would <laughs> suck being that old. There's no way you'd know unless you cut it open and counted the rings. Count the rings. <laughs> the dragonfly rings. Oh, my God. <laughs> but the most popular creature to inhabit the Burrowong Swamp is the Burrowong, Burrowong Bunyip. Burrowong, try saying that. I can't. After a couple of tinnies. <laughs> Hello, Burrowong Bunyip. Oh, I've seen the bloody Burrowong Bunyip. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, from what I've read, there's not really been anyone that's seen the Burrowong Bunyip, but, okay. but a shit ton of people have heard it. Okay. So, the roar is said to send shivers down the spines of locals. Okay. In the 1930s, during the construction of the railway from Robertson to Mossvale, a workers' camp was set up near the swamp. Yep. One night... The workers fled because they were horrified at a strange noise that they'd heard that was believed to have been a bunyip coming out of the swamp. But people then speculated that maybe they just wanted the next day off work. That's a good reason. Or maybe they'd spent too long at the pub the night before and they'd just made up a story that they'd run off from the Burrowong bunyip. So there's speculation there that that was BS, but apparently it happened. Um, In the 1960s, a bull-like roar was often heard around the tiny village Hmm. by all the locals. It was was just part of the town. Oh, it's just the bunyip. So it sounded like a bull, Hmm. but really loud, apparently. Many years ago, the roar was so loud that it shook the bottles off the top shelf of the bar at the local pub. Whoa. Now, interestingly, the bunyip hasn't been heard since part of the swamp was dammed. Very interesting. The reason this is interesting is that the theory is the sound may have been created by tons of peat moss expanding and contracting with temperature variations. Really? Yes. So it's believed to be at the core of an ancient volcano as well. So there may very well be seismic activity below the swamp, Mm. which could be causing strange noises. Swamp gas. Swamp gas. (laughs) (laughs) It's always friggin' swamp gas. So I found that very interesting. That is very interesting. So it kind of went, the fact that it was an audible thing more than an actual visual thing. 
Yeah, and I didn't so many see, people. There was no profound instances where people have seen it. There is a description of it, which I didn't bother writing down. Yeah. Because it didn't come as it was. It's believed to be. Yeah, it was very fairy taley, yeah. so I didn't want to waste your time, folks. Fair enough. I'm not about wasting time around here. Let's just get to the facts. <laughs> Straight to the point. So I, I, I can, I think you can safely say the roaring bunyip of the Burrowung Swamp may have very well been to do with peat moss expanding and contracting. Mm. Very interesting. And it would be exacerbated by seismic activity if it was on if it all a, if it was together. on an old yeah. volcano. It would make sense. So there you go. Mm, very interesting. But one. if you have been to Burrowung Swamp and have had an experience with the roaring bunyip. I'd love to hear about it. Mm. Or if you've heard this story before but a different version or perhaps... Or any bunyip. Or any bunyip for that matter. Yeah. Send me your bunyip stories. <laughs> bunyip. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good word. So, do you like to ride the waves? Do you like to hang ten? Surf the couch. Surf the couch? <laughs> If you're a surfer or were a surfer back in the 1970s, you may have heard of the the legend of the Headless Wanderer. Now, Wilson's Promontory is a beach. Mm -hmm. And apparently in 1972, a couple of surfers taking a stroll at 2 a.m. felt creeped out. 2 a.m. stroll? 2 a.m. Don't know why. Don't know. Don't know what they were doing. Maybe they were secret lovers. Who knows? They were walking along the beach, (laughs) headed down. To go and check out the surf, I guess. And they got goosebumps and all the hair stood up and they had the feeling they were being followed. So they turned around and noticed there was someone behind them, assuming it was just another person out walking because yeah. apparently it's normal to go for walks at 2am. Yep. Kept walking, got even more creeped out, turned again to see this thing even closer and it was a cloaked woman. Oh, but the reason they got creeped out the most was that they realised it couldn't just be someone walking around because there was no head. Oh. It was a headless phantom. It's kind of important. So naturally, they bolted. As you would. And then shortly after that, another couple of dudes were driving along the same beach looking for a surf spot in the evening or early hours of the morning Yeah. when they saw something step out from the side of the road Cloaked female figure, yeah. no head. Holy Before Lord. they could stop the car, the car went straight through her. Whoa. So they were freaked out, no end, and took off too. So now... Just kept going. So because, you know, I'm sure there's been other sightings, but there's been enough that she's got a name. Oh, okay. Her name is Biddy. 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 So if you're ever in Wilson's Promontory and you feel like a scare... Mm. Go for a wander in the wee small hours and see if you can spot Biddy the Headless Wanderer. Biddy the Headless Liddy. Biddy the (laughs) Headless Liddy. Now I'm going to handball over to Jimmy now, who's going to tell you about Elvira, the Haunted Hearse. The Haunted Hearse Elvira. Well, this was a 1967 Cadillac hearse that was used very briefly in Pennsylvania for only a year. Um, it then got shipped down to Pennsylvania. Got shit down or shit got, down? Got shit down. <laughs> got shit down. <laughs> got shit down. Got right. Shit down. <laughs> um, back to <laughs> California, where it did 30 years service, just transporting dead bodies, doing its job, Good. all the things it has to do. And then in 97 got sold to a gentleman in Australia who was using it for um, spooky tours through the city. Had there been reports prior of this car, just knowing he was using it as spooky for spooky tours, was there any stories about it yet? There was no prior stories. He basically just Just was looking looking for a hearse. Got it. That's what he was chasing, something to fit the part. Right. Um, He transferred it to Right Hand Drive for Australian Roads. And then every now and again would have people mentioning they were getting a bit more than they'd bargained for on his spooky tour. That they were having things happen such as hands stroking their hair or 
tapping on their knees or these sorts or hot and cold areas of the car. Yeah. Creepy. Which, yeah, quite creepy. Imagine feeling a hand on your leg and yeah. not seeing one. Oh, that'd be gross. Totally gross. Totally gross. <laughs> so much so that he decided he would put it up on eBay as a bit of a kicker to see if someone could bid and spend the night in the hearse. There was a young lady who decided she would have a go. Would you? I wouldn't, no. No, I could happily say I wouldn't. She won the bid and got to spend the night in the hearse. And her, she was obviously already quite into the idea of the paranormal because yes. she brought her EMF sensor well, and she's her, gone on eBay and look did for, to spend the night in a haunted hearse. She's got to be some kind of kook. So she's brought all her gear and spent the night in the hearse. She reports of the most of the night hearing tapping on the car itself coming from the inside and it was constantly moving in a, in a direction around the car. It just kept circling. Right. Um, she also reported large amounts of hot and cold areas in the car, some as cold as minus four, which is... That's pretty absurd. Really, really cold. What was the temperature on the evening? Um, it was quite a warm night. It was 23 degrees. What? So it's a hot... You know, what you'd class as a reasonably warm night. Could could he have rigged the car to do that? I suppose if he put a lot of effort in, the, yeah, it's an option. Yeah. But the temperature changes is the thing. And it it's was, because and it probably you would have heard if, if, if there was some kind of mechanism doing it, it would be, would you have to be able to hear it for something to generate cold air? Oh, so as far as mechanisms, yeah, for you'd have to... To refrigerate to minus four, that's you'd need to have you'd need to have something, something running. Okay, there's so no that might debunk about it. my theory that it was rigged. Um, she also said that she had a strange blue hue around her feet for about half an hour. That's super weird. And did she have any hands on her knees or anything? Uh, I believe she did. Right. But uh, it was quite rare. The main thing for her was the tapping. That was almost constant the whole night through. Right. Even to the point where she got out of the hearse to check several times. If there was anything outside. If there was anything like leaves falling on the on the exterior of the body or anything like that to create this, this tapping that just kept coming. Um, now, if it was a warm night. Yeah. 23 degrees in Australia. And she's hearing re- repetitious patting, uh, tapping. Yeah. I might be inclined to think it's a bug. Flying, trying to find its way out of the vehicle. Well, it makes sense when you, you think about how big it is too. Hearses yeah. aren't small on the inside, and trying it would be to hard find to track a small. I mean, even a fly can cause such a loud noise. That it can Especially find when space. you're trying to sleep at yeah. night time. And in I your mean, room, she's in there <laughs> looking for spooky stuff. Any noise might be misconstrued as this paranormal. Is true. I mean, I've tried to find bugs making noises in our room in summer sometimes, and you just you can't find them. We've tried to find a howling bloody frog <laughs> every summer because it creeps the girls out. The frogs. You can follow that noise and be on top yeah. of it, and you can't see the little bastards. Exactly. So I, I would, I would say that it was possibly an insect. It's quite possible, definitely. Especially if she's got little devices and things. And... Well, it's, it's funny you say that. There was the other thing was the EMF sensor she had was. It, she said she brought it in completely charged. Yeah. And it did keep dropping out like it was going flat. Okay. And then it would spike mm. as soon as that had happened right. as well. So that was another thing. Like she said she had obviously had quite a few experiences in there. Yeah. And, yeah, that was quite interesting. To, yeah. But it wasn't just her. That was just someone who did spend an entire night and was prepared for yeah. such an occasion. Yeah. Plus, I mean, you've got to also add to the fact that people who are Expecting. going into this Elvira the Haunted Hearse, yeah. they're going wanting to experience something. Exactly. So it's... They're paying money to go and for a ride in this car. They, they're going to, every little thing... Already waiting for it. Yeah. So 
call me a bastard skeptic. No, 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 but I, I, I agree with you on that one because yeah. it's it's just one of those things. And yep. yes, it's hard to say that minus four was a hard thing to reach just on a whim, but who knows what she was using to measure it. I just don't know. Yeah. Thanks, Jimmy. You're welcome. Cool story. So carrying on with the car theme, I'm going to read to you now some information about the cursed car of Sarajevo. Have you heard of this, Jimmy? No. Okay, well, this was Archduke Franz Ferdinand, um, and he really wanted a car that would impress the public when him and his lovely wife toured the Bosnian capital of Sarajevo. Bit of a show off. Yeah. Nice. Now, this was in a bad time for Europe. There was a lot of political unrest. The war was about to start, the First World War, um, because, yeah, there was a lot of shit going on between all the powers. On June 28, 1914, the royal couple arrived in Sarajevo in their blood-red six-seat open tourer when a young fanatic, armed with a pistol leapt onto the running board and began laughing in the faces of Archduke Ferdinand and his lovely wife and began to open fire into their bodies, shot after shot. Laughing the whole time. So after this double assassination, um, it's basically this instant Mm -hmm. is what kicked off World War I, the Great War. Wow. This was the last straw. Yeah, yeah. Then... The casualty, as we know, the casualty li- list, the number yeah. for World War. So this incident then spiralled into the casualty of 20 million people wow. died during the Great War. Because this was in the days of attrition. So this is before, you know, there was different types of warfare. It was literally yeah. cannon fodder. People yeah. were used just to try and gain ground, just kill all those ones. We'll get, gain, gain another five metres. Yeah, yeah. And then we'll push again. We'll, we'll lose another 2,000 soldiers, but we'll gain another five metres. And that's how wars were fought Yeah. until, uh, yeah, as, as we progressed. Yeah. So this assassination was... The kicker. The kicker for the Great War. Wow. Now, after Armistice, the newly approved governor of Yugoslavia had the car restored. Oh. So he was like, I like that car. I'm going to take that. So this is the governor of Yugoslavia. He decided he wanted it. Got it restored to first class condition. Mm -hmm. Real tight job. Um, After four accidents in the car, one of which he lost his arm. Whoa. He basically said, I want want it destroyed. It's cursed. Don't want this. It's cursed. It's definitely cursed. Not my favourite toy. Yeah. So a friend of his who was a doctor... He scoffed at the notion that the car was cursed and said, stop being ridiculous. You're not going to destroy it. I'll take it off your hands. He drove it happily for the next six months until the overturned vehicle was found on a highway with a doctor's body crushed beneath it. Oh. So that's, what, nearly four. Nearly four people. Luckily, the governor of Yugoslavia had his head screwed on and went, Four accidents, one arm. I've given enough to this car. See ya. Slapped the roof and said, hey, this has got some good mileage on this. I believe you. <laughs> so he's not been dumb. Sadly, his friend, the doctor who laughed at him, met his demise. Then another doctor decided he wanted the car, became the next owner. And having, once he'd bought the car, his superstitious patience all began leaving his practice. Like, we are not going to come to you. You've got the cursed car. So he then sold it um, to a Swiss racing bloke doohickey team. Doohickey guy. Um, Hang on. Where have I gone? I've written it upside down. Yes, so it was a Swiss race car driver who decided to race the car in the Dolomites when the car strangely threw him over a stone wall, and he died of a broken neck. So that's another another one. Another one, damn. Yeah. Then a well-to-do farmer then acquired the car, which stalled one day while another farmer was towing it for repairs. The vehicle suddenly growled into full power and knocked the tow car aside, killing both farmers. What? So that's another two. Didn't even make it. Didn't even get to drive it. Was getting it towed. Whoa. And apparently it came on. 
full tilt, <laughs> smashed into the tow car, killed both the farmers. Holy smokes. So this car is proper cursed. <laughs> um, now, That's crazy. another private owner decided the car needed a less sinister colour scheme. So he bought it and he was like, okay, maybe if I paint it, because it was the blood red colour. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yep. He decided he painted a lovely cheerful blue. Then him and five of his friends decided to go for a drive in the car to a wedding. Oh. So, I think his name was Hirschfeld. Hirschfeld and his four friends, or four of his guests, sorry, died in a head-on smash on the way to the wedding. Holy smokes. So that's another, another five people. That is ridiculous. Everyone that drove this car, which is why, finally, the rebuilt car was shipped to Vienna Museum, where it was lovingly cared for by Karl Brunner, who forbids anyone to sit in it. Holy smokes. That is crazy. But World War Two kicks yeah. off. Bombs are dropped, reducing the museum to rubble. Nothing of the car was ever found, nor was Karl Brunner. So it took one last victim. What? Yep. That's crazy. So that is the cursed car of Sarajevo, folks. Holy the smokes, car that man. started World War One or the Great <laughs> War and claimed twenty million lives. Wow. Yeah. Pretty intense. That's intense. Yeah. To wind up tonight's episode, we're gonna talk skinwalkers. Oh no. Skinwalkers. Do we have That's to what you say? Walkers. Skin. Skinwalkers. Ew. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so um, skinwalkers is actually a term that comes from Navajo culture and it's a type of harmful witch who has the ability to turn into, possess or disguise themselves as an animal. Um, the term is never used for healers, so it's not to be misconstrued with other forms of Navajo witches, which yeah, are healers. Yeah. Yep. Um, so yes, it's, it's a harmful, it's a negative, yeah. negative thing. Apparently, so it goes, they transform by wearing an animal's pelt. Mm -hmm. Now, the Navajo word is actually yen, uh, yenaldushi. Mm -hmm. They're evil human beings who have gained supernatural power by murdering a close relative. That's the belief in Whoa. the Navajo culture. So in order to attain the ability to do this, Just you need to murder a member really. of your family. Yep. Wow. Um, oddly, they're also found in... In Norse folklore, um, it, the Nor Norse folklore says that a skinwalker is a person who can transform and shape into the shape of an animal or take characteristics of said animal. Okay. So there are skinwalkers in Norse culture as well, which is, really? yeah. Holy smokes. Yeah, so there you go. I don't know if any of you knew that. No, I didn't. I didn't. I thought it was a strictly Navajo yeah, thing. That's what I thought. Um, here's a couple of fun facts yeah. about skinwalkers. So they're most frequently seen or associated with coyotes, wolves, foxes, eagles, or crows. Right. It is also said that they can steal faces of different people to appear as someone you know. Oh, that's not think. cool. Yeah, so you look at them because the thing is, the folklore is if they've stolen the face of someone, mm. you will naturally look because it's someone you know. Yeah, yeah. And if you lock eyes with a skinwalker, they can absorb themselves into your body and take control of your oh, man. actions. That's not cool. Yeah, it's full-blown dark shit. Yeah. In Navajo, skinwalker or yanadushi basically... It's the term means he who walks on all fours. Oh. So that's what it means. Okay. Skinwalkers only entered public discourse since 1996. Really? When a team of scientists ventured to a particular ranch oh. and started investigating proper documented cases. cases of this. So this is the case of Skinwalker Ranch, which yeah. we talked about last week. Apparently, skinwalkers can run very long distances, up to 200 miles. Whoa. They hang around graveyards and have the ability to dig up graves at a very rapid pace. 
People who see them describe them as hollowed out dog-like animals. Whoa. Yeah. That's... They're not like, you know, you say I'll transform into animals and you go, yeah. oh, well, it's just people seeing animals. Yeah. Everyone I've heard, it's, yeah, it's like a, a carcass kind of looking thing. Right. That's how they, yeah, it's pretty gross. That is gross. Apparently you can kill a skinwalker if you call them by the human name. So if you somehow can figure out who what? it is and... Really? Yeah, and you call oh, them by the on. human name, you can kill them. Um, they're most commonly encountered near Native American reservations, mm -hmm. um, though they have been seen all over the United States. Um, people have compared them to a rake, which is another creature encountered in the northeast. Apparently, it's got similar traits to a skinwalker. Oh, okay. So, like now, you were saying before, they are sort of tied in, but not the same. Yeah. Like different cultures having the same thing. Well, it all stems down. The brass tacks of it is, it's a witch, or mm. it's it's a magic person who's yeah. able to manipulate, like necromancy. Yeah, yeah take someone's skin and then or something's skin and then is able to animate it. Yeah, yeah. Or become it. Or become it, yeah. Just which is freaking gross. Totally. So the encounters of this, if you're just going, this just sounds like it's made up. Yeah. The reason why this is creepy is there are so many if you look it up, people have seen weird creatures and experienced strange things around the areas of these folklores and that's what they're they're basically saying it must have been a skinwalker because they don't know what else the hell these things are that they're seeing. Yeah. So a lot of people are experiencing creatures and they've tried to work out what kind of animal it is, they just can't but it doesn't make other. sense. Yeah. Or having creepy experiences with something or someone that looks like someone but doesn't. But, it, yeah. But yeah. it is, but it's wrong. Yeah. Again... Super creepy. It's the whole thing, the, the whole idea behind, idea behind it. it. If you want to get totally creeped, it's really terrifying. If you want to get totally creeped out, search it up online. There's heaps of stuff on it. You can look on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of Reddit stories, which, I mean, you can't always believe what you hear. Reddit quite often is people writing in made-up stories, but there are some ones out there of people actually, the, the eyewitness ones. I think yeah. it's called Evil Encounters. Is a really good show where people, they interview people who are retelling experiences. There's a fair few on there that have okay. had skinwalker experiences. I recommend that show. If okay. you want something that, because I, you know, I need convincing. Yeah. I like spooky stuff, but I do like to be, I like to be convinced. Yeah. I don't like sort of flaky yeah. made up. Just jumping in. Yep, so I'm going to read you now to wrap it up, which this may not make the final cut. If it does, hooray. <laughs> <laughs> but we are running out of time. So here is a, um, an eyewitness account of one of these creatures that I thought I would read to you just to give you an example of what they are like or what people are seeing and why they're thinking they are these creatures. Yeah. My father owns a small delivery service that operates out of Farmington NM. Don't know what that is. New Mexico? Yeah. We mostly deliver small packages out to the middle of nowhere that are too much hassle for the larger delivery companies to bother with. My dad is the only employee and we have a few pickup trucks and a trailer. One day we get a delivery out to Window Rock, Arizona on the Navajo Reservation about two hours from Farmington. My dad gets the call for the job while he's chilling with his Navajo friend, Travis, and his girlfriend. Travis mentions how he's got family in Window Rock and that he hasn't seen in ages and suggests they go with him. It was about six or seven at the time and it was summertime, so Dad decides we'll all we'll go down together. He can do his delivery real quick. Then, while Travis sees his family, we can go check out Window Rock. Big rock face with a larger hole in it that goes out to the other side. It's pretty cool. Sounds so pretty like cool. the one in Calvary, I'm guessing. Yeah, sounds cool. We had to convoy, in, we had to convoy in separate trucks since my dad's was loaded down with freight. We decided to bring along some walkie-talkies so we could communicate with each other. We spent our time at Window Rock. Everything, everything is generally uneventful, and we start heading home along the old highway with my dad in front, dad and I in front, and Travis and his girlfriend in their truck behind us. I honestly don't remember most of Window Rock trip, but this next part I can never forget. 
were somewhere on the highway between Window Rock and Gallup, New Mexico. It had just rained earlier in the day and the road was kind of slick, so we were taking it pretty slow. On the left of the highway there's nothing but sandstone cliffs and on the right there is a huge field separated by the road by a small barbed wire fence. We crest the top of the hill and down at the bottom of the hill we see what appears to be a very large dog sitting back on its haunches in the middle of the road facing the, cl the cliffs. My dad says over the radio, hey Trav, do you see that big ass dog? Travis starts yelling back over the radio, that is not a dog, speed up right now and hit it. He almost sounds hysterical, he just keeps screaming, hit it, J JJ, you have to hit it, please, please, hit that fucking thing right now. So my dad starts to speed up as we get a bit closer, and I can begin to see it a little more clearly. It's covered in brown, wiry, matted hair that appears to have dried blood all over it. It's still facing the cliffs, but at the moment our headlights hit it, it turns to look at us. It has a face. I don't know how else to describe it other than a mix between a bear's and a human face. It looks twisted and distorted and almost in pain. As we get closer to this thing, we start to realise it's actually fucking huge. Though it was still sitting on its haunches, it is about shoulder height with the, with the hood of the truck. We get literally inches from hitting it when it lets out a scream that sounds like someone screaming as if their lungs were filling with water. It leaps back towards the field, landing just on our side of the barbed wire fence. Then, with another leap, it was gone from sight. Travis comes over the radio again. Holy shit, keep driving. We have to get out of here. We have to go faster. He kept repeating the last part. We have to get out of here. We have to go faster. Pretty soon, we were speeding like crazy. And just as we come to the near outskirts of Gallup, we get pulled over. Travis pulls his truck over with us. Naturally... This makes the cop, a Navajo man himself, very on edge and he immediately asks why Travis felt the need to pull over as well. Travis says, we just saw a skinwalker a few miles back and it's been following us. The officer immediately turns white, stammers something about a verbal warning, gets in his car and takes off. We do the same. We didn't see anything else that night, but when we got home, Travis refused to let us leave without taking some kind of Navajo totem thing that was supposed to keep it away. So this one I got off off the internet because it's the best basic uh, yeah. description of what people are seeing. Yeah, yeah. And and it just sums up. It's like an animal, but it's got a face. What the hell? That is crazy. So if any of you have heard cool skinwalker stories, I would love to hear about them. I do. I do know that we have had a listener in the past who is Native American. Yeah. And he has said that he grew up with those. Stories of skinwalkers. Holy smoke. So if you are listening, I'd love to hear from you. Have you had any experiences while you were growing up or have you yeah. heard of any? Holy we smoke. want to hear first-hand experiences from some locals if you've got them. That's crazy. And that wraps up the show. Have some sweet dreams tonight, <laughs> folks. Thanks wow, for tuning in. Doozy. I know. Got that. <laughs> so I will keep bringing you some pretty spooky content if you're enjoying the show. I want to hear from you. If you've got some cool stories, please send them in. And stay spooky, folks. This is Morgan. And Jimmy. Stay creepy. Bye. Bye.